This is Think Tech Hawaii. Community matters here. Anywhere? No. That okay. is Lou Pugliarisi <laughs> in the flesh. How about a shot of Lou? <laughs> See, we have talked to him so many times, but he has not been in the studio. And the I'm joyfulness to today <laughs> is he's here with us in Honolulu in the studio. Say hello, Lou. Hello. I'm happy to be here, Jay. Thanks for inviting me. It's great to have you. So uh, just, just to, to tell you who he is, uh, as indicated, as you know from early, early, many early shows, uh, he's the president of EPRINC the Energy Policy Research Foundation, I get that right? Yeah, absolutely. And, and um, in Washington, D.C., and he covers uh, energy there and around the country and around the world, and he talks to us every couple of weeks on energy in America and beyond. Um, and just one little thing more is that uh, he's here for uh, 10 days or so, and in the middle of that, he's going to Singapore. For Bangkok. Ba Bangkok. Sorry, <laughs> let me change my notes on that. Bangkok. Yeah. Um, and he's going to be doing an energy conference there in Bangkok. Yeah, so part of the workshop with our Japanese colleague research group in Japan, Institute yeah. of Energy Economics, Japan. Great. And when he gets back to Washington, he's going to do another conference. What's that about? So we have several events. Uh, we are going to do a follow-up workshop on September 8th that we have with our Japanese colleague, but we're also going to do an event at the Canadian Embassy on... Uh, September 6th, called Building Out the North American Energy Infrastructure. And as you know, that's resulted in a lot of controversial issues, the Dakota Access Pipeline and all the protesters. And by the way, today, the Dakota Access Pipeline Company, which is owned by Energy Transfer Partners, sued Greenpeace under a RICO provision. <laughs> RICO, really? <laughs> yes, claiming that they engaged a in a conspiracy statute, yeah. and racketeering to destroy their project. <laughs> That'll be interesting to watch. That's so the courts handle that. Yeah. <laughs> That's what I call pushback. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> okay, well, let's talk about our principal subject, yeah. which is Asian in nature. And uh, may I say, Lou has a lot of connection with Asia. He's, he's got some kids that speak Mandarin which is always good to have in the household these yeah, days. Yeah, let's hope it know, pays off, yeah. Planning for the future. <laughs> <laughs> right here in Manoa, that's fabulous. Yeah. So um, let's talk about the principal subject of our discussion. That is the coming conflict between LNG and coal in Asia. So can you describe the way it is and the conflict and the way you think it's going to be? Yeah, so if you think about, of course, Asia is a very varied set of countries. Some are energy rich, some are energy poor. But it's undergoing a, a big transformation right now. But it has, over the past 20 years, uh, become a, a highly reliant on coal to generate electric power to gen for homes. And stuff. Asia is also one of the last remaining parts of the world that uses, except for the Hawaiian Islands, <laughs> that uses a large amount of heavy fuel oil, a direct crude oil burn to generate uh, electric power. So gas has a lot of potential benefits for Asia. One is it could uh, help out with local air pollution problems because it's a clean burning fuel. It can also move you along the gradient from a more intensive carbon dioxide emitter to a less intensive carbon dioxide emitter. So in that regard, I thought what we do is first look at what does the kind of uh, coal capacity look like in Asia. And if we pull up the first slide. Okay. Okay, here we go. So this shows you just for one year, right? And this is dollars in billions, right? So this actually, this is installed uh, capacity for uh, coal and gas fired power investment in Asian markets, right? For and in that year, about $65 billion was spent investing in new coal-fired capacity, but only about $10 billion in natural gas. This is power plant capacity. Mm -hmm. So coal is still a dominant and important force throughout Asia. They have clean coal, though. They have clean coal, and it is quite possible to use with these high-efficiency uh, boilers, with uh, the use of scrubbers and uh, other kinds of environmental devices it is quite possible to get the particulate uh, emission to a low level. So mm -hmm. if you go to Beijing and you see all this terrible air in Beijing, if you talk to a chemical engineer, he says, well, if the Chinese would just turn on their scrubbers, you know, that air would be a lot better. Now, it's more complicated than that. Yeah. But, you know, the Chinese, you can talk about all these global climate agreements, but I don't think the Chinese have really covered themselves in glory 
in doing the most basic things, which is getting the kind of soot out of the atmosphere. So, are they trying? So there's a debate about that. I think they are trying, but the ability of the national or the central government to get the local guys to behave isn't always effective. Uh, said, okay, sure. Yeah. And I remember going down the Yangtze River and uh, seeing barge after barge, yeah. huge barges of yeah. you know, black soot and right. coal. So if we're going to put, so one, we've spoken about this in the past. If the, if we're going to, the U.S., because of its uh, vast natural gas supply, we now probably can produce ever-increasing volumes of natural gas in the U.S., so much so that we don't have enough to, we can't use it domestically. We're exporting something like 4 billion cubic feet a day to Mexico by pipeline. We're probably going to get up to 2 billion cubic feet a day of liquefied natural gas. This is where we take the gas, we turn it into a liquid at very high cost. It's not a cheap thing to do. Mm -hmm. Put it on a tanker, either ship it through the Panama Canal or all around uh, South America for Asian markets. It's a billion dollar tanker. Oh, yeah, yeah. And the, the, these, and the, these, these are massive facilities. I, I went to the opening of the one at Sabine Pass in Louisiana. It was quite something. Yeah. So, and, but in order to uh, move this gas into Asia, we, we are facing a number of challenges. And one of the challenges are, are that uh, in the main countries like Japan, Korea, and Taiwan, which represent 75 to 80 percent of world LNG demand, their population, their electricity growth is growing quite slowly. And this growth is also highly uncertain depending upon the rate at which other fuel sources are permitted or end up generating power. Those two are nuclear power and coal. Mm -hmm. And as you know, there's a sort of anti-nuclear movement underway sure. for a lot of reasons in Japan and Korea and Taiwan as well. And so there's some existing capacity which is offline. In Taiwan and Korea, there's decisions on what to do with existing capacity, whether to extend it out or reduce it. So we have a great deal of uncertainty on uh, the well, future. If you have LNG infrastructure that, that allows coal, that relies on coal, and you want to change to LNG, even if the LNG is around, even if it's cheaper, you still have to pay the cost of moving the infrastructure from coal to LNG. Yes, and I think uh, this uh, the next slide might help us understand this a little bit better, huh? yeah. because the market is quite segmented. So let's take a look at the next slide. Okay, I think this is a really interesting slide because it shows, if you look at the segment of the world LNG market, it's really divided into different kinds of uh, characteristics. And we, we've got the number of countries listed there in each one. In some countries with maturing, when we say maturing indigenous resource, what that means is their gas production is declining. <laughs> and so Indonesia, Malaysia, Pakistan, Thailand, Bahrain, parts of Europe as well. That is actually where you're going to see a lot of potential demand growth to 2030. Right? Uh, but if you go to places, but there are other elements of natural gas demand, countries that are growing rapidly, like China and India, also we haven't historically thought about LNG as a flex fuel, but for peaking or for seasonal demand, parts of the world that have not too much in Asia, cold winters or seasonal requirements. Some places like uh, Kuwait and South Africa, they're really displacing their energy mix away from coal. And even bunkering. Many cruise ships now are considering moving to LNG uh, so they can meet the like, coastal zone management requirements. Mm -hmm. Lots of countries don't put, they, they won't permit you to emit sulfur dioxide and all the heavy fuel oil components that are often prevalent in diesel fuel and heavy fuel oil in big tankers. Mm -hmm. So you're going to see a movement away to more LNG tankers. As the primary uh, fuel on the ship? Yes, but, that, but in order to do that, you have to have what we call bunkering facilities, a place for the ship to go and refuel. On land, yeah. And there's a great deal of interest in Asia in building the bunkering facilities in Singapore or, or Tokyo or even Korea. Uh, LNG on a ship, is that going to be more, um, I want to call it dispatchable, more quickly? Uh, you, you know, you can bring so, up the energy. Yeah, this quickly. is really good. So historically, LNG uh, was, as uh, my friend who lives here in, in uh, uh, Hawaii says, Fair Dune Fresh Iraq, he says, well, it's like getting married. 
So if you go to the old the way the model contract was worked, you had to find a buyer and developer of the LNG, someone to build the tankers, and a good credit worthy receiver. They would get together and they would go to the bank and say, we would like some risk capital for this. And the bank would say, no, we don't provide risk capital. We provide liquidity. You take the risk. <laughs> so these three together. So that market was very locked in. It had very severe destination restrictions, but that's all changing now. Mm. Shorter term demand and the emergence of new kinds of technologies, which would allow shorter term and more flexible markets for LNG. Does this mean that the banks will take risks? Probably not, but you can take, there are other ways to, to fob off this risk. So one of the interesting problems we have in Asia is some countries have uh, un, a lot of uncertainty or poor credit risk. But, and also uh, there's always been a requirement you build a large re, uh, installation facility to regasify this fuel. Because it comes in as a liquid from the tanker, right? So it has to be regassed and turned in back into a gas. But the development of something called flori floating storage regasification, regasification units. Oh, you FSRU. mean FSRU. Exactly, <laughs> FSRU. That these now offer enormous potential and flexibility because if your country doesn't pay, you can refloat it and move it somewhere else. So. I think so it's like a barge. It's like a barge. And you, yeah. and you have tugboats or other boats that will take it away. Put it into position and they just take it away. So you totally. leave it there for a while, as long as they're paying the Yeah, bill. as long as they pay. And they <laughs> <laughs> take it away if they're not. Yeah, actually, credit, credit worthiness is a big problem in this business for the, yeah. to expand the market among the traditional yeah. buyers. So if you're, if you're careful about risk and uh, you don't want to lose your investment, uh, you're going to be careful about uh, investing in a shore facility and yeah. the country may not be completely stable. Yeah, and if you, and I think for gas, uh, it, it has, it, part of the problem is it's really still not as cheap as coal. So national policies in the Asian countries have to say, well, we'll pay a little more for the gas because it's worth it to clean up local air pollution or because it's worth it for a long time, you know, secure energy source for us. Yeah. Well, um, conflict means that um, uh, ultimately there will be a change. Ultimately, there'll be a, a, a transformation, mm -hmm. a transition from uh, coal, which is, I guess, most most of those countries are relying on coal, yes. uh, to to LNG. What, what's your timeline on this, Lou? So I think that. Uh, Right now, if you think about the international financial institutions like the World Bank, the, you know, the uh, International uh, Finance Corporation, the IFC, they are not financing any co new coal-fired power plants with public, these public funds or these public financing instruments. So that's the beginning of the transition, really. Yes, but the Asian Development Bank still finances coal plants, mm. right? Mm. Japan actually has one on the books. Mm. Um, the Philippines is considered a big coal plant. So the pace at which the countries decide is a, it's really going to be a matter of policy. And for them to move their policy away from coal, I think they're going to have to have strategies which show them that it's not too much more expensive, that they can build out the internal use, internal infrastructure for gas, power plants. In many cases, these smaller countries like Vietnam, and Thailand, they may not have the scale to really make these plants work. So we're going to have to find kind of unique financial instruments yeah. to uh, do this. And that in turn may, may depend on the technology, uh, absolutely, the technology of absolutely. these uh, F, F, uh, FSRU uh, right. units, because um, if, if it gets more efficient, then mm -hmm. the cost of the LNG goes down and right. maybe, maybe even goes down below the cost of coal, maybe even one day. Yeah. Anything's possible. <laughs> <laughs> okay, well, I, I was, you know, I was interested in getting a prediction on how long that would take, and uh, I, I guess it's not easy. You want to give me a five uh, years, ten years? Yeah, well, I, I think you, I think you can get you could get substantial, substantial displacement uh, over the next twenty years. Twenty years. These are long-term projects. They okay. Take time. And I and I in turn would like to make a prediction for you. <laughs> We're, we're going to take a break now, Lou. Okay. <laughs> and my prediction is that we'll be back in one minute. <laughs> You're a good forecaster. It moves quickly. <laughs> I'll be right back. This is Think Tech Hawaii, raising public awareness.
yes, you can beat the world, you can beat the war. You could talk to God, go banging on his door. You can throw your hands up, you can beat the clock. You can move a mountain, you can break rocks. You can be a master, don't wait for luck. Dedicate yourself and you can find yourself. Okay, we're back, and I guess my prediction was exactly right. That was exactly right. one minute. Mm -hmm. This is Lou Pugliarisi. He's visiting Hawaii from his, uh, his operation. His headquarters in Washington, <laughs> D.C. He's the, is the CEO, the chair, the, rather the president of uh, EPRINC, the Energy Policy Research Foundation, Foundation in Washington, mm -hmm. and he's. Uh, here to go in many different directions. We're, you know, we are in the, we say we are in the space between energy economics, petroleum economics, and public policy. So yeah. We've been doing that since 1944. 1944? Yes, wow. Well, you know, <laughs> Not you, me personally. You're looking pretty well. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> so, uh, in this part of the show, we want to talk about something different. Last part of the show, we talked about the coming conflict. That was very interesting between LNG and coal in Asia. Now this part of the show, we're moving on to another issue, uh, one in the United States, one under the rubric of our uh, Energy in America banner, and that is uh, uh, President Trump's strategy for energy dominance, in quotes, uh, in the U.S. So, Lou, this is so interesting. Uh, dominance, qu'est-ce que c'est dominance? What does that mean? Well, you know, I'm, I'm not sure exactly what that means. Um, maybe only President Trump knows that, but I mean... If we look at what's happened in North America, it's a quite remarkable story. And we just did some uh, analysis on this. I'll send it out to you. If you took the three countries of North America, because that's what you really have to do, the U.S., Canada, Mexico, and you said, okay, how much do these countries, when they're put together as a single unit, how much oil do they import? And how much gas do they import? And it's true that the U.S. still physically brings in 10 million barrels a day, but we send out 5 million barrels a day in value-added products, and mostly refined products. Mm -hmm. And for the North of America as a whole, with the, if you blend in Mexico and the U.S., uh, our net imports are only 4 million barrels a day. And within a few years, North America, that is the U.S., Canada, Mexico together, will be net zero importers. Yes, we will import and export, but our net imports of petroleum will be zero. Within a year or so, our net exports, our net imports of natural gas will go to zero. So it's really so going, that's going North to a wash. North, Amer North America is no longer going to be a net draw on world supplies of gas and oil. So we are sort of already heading for dominance. Mm -hmm. But we do have, I do think, in this sense, the President Trump has some points. We have a regulatory program that creates a lot of uncertainty. And the National Environmental Policy Act, I always tell this story, I worked in the Interior Department for a few years, right? And the Secretary decided, oh, let's improve the grazing lands out west. So that's about $10 million worth of fencing. You know, we have all these public lands in the U.S. <laughs> We then went ahead in order to meet all the requirements of the National Environmental Policy Act and not be sued, we spent $100 million writing environmental impact statements. <laughs> and so you have to ask yourself, you know, What's wrong is that a picture? regulatory <laughs> strategy that really makes sense? Yeah. Yeah. And actually the president announced that all major infrastructure projects in the U.S. will now be approved within two years. The, the review process should not be more than two years. And I don't think anyone really realizes how difficult that is without major change of legislation because you can't do anything in the U.S. without addressing the Endangered Species Act, uh, getting permits from the Fish and Wildlife Service, the Bureau of Land Management, the Interior Department, Corps the Forest Service, and the Corps of Engineers. There's a, talking about LNG, there's a major LNG project in Jordan Cove, Oregon, a very depressed area. The local community wants the project. 
the gas supplies for that project will come from Colorado and also Canada. And it will be right on the west coast. No, no Panama Canal. Ship it strictly straight to Asia. And that project has had enormous problems in getting all the permits it needs to proceed. Even though the local community wants it, everybody wants that project to proceed. You know, it means a lot of jobs. And I, so I, where's I, the holdup? So the holdup is a lot of the environmental community think you know, that this project should, it should be viewed as unnecessary, that we could instead produce power in Asia from renewable fuels and other things. And we don't really have a good system to kind of resolve these issues in the country. Or coordinate them when you have or to go get and, permits from, yeah. from 10 agencies. And in fact, I can tell you that Jordan Cove itself met with the president and he said, probably a little impetuously, don't worry, we're going to get all those permits. Well, there's a famous statement John Kennedy met, said once. A woman asked him a question if he would take, if he would, you know, see that this issue got fixed, that had to do with some problem out west. He says, I don't know, I'll check with the government. <laughs> <laughs> That would have been better for Trump to say that. <laughs> exactly, exactly. So, and so I think all the other kinds of problems he's creating uh, with his, you know, off-the-cuff remarks are, are not helpful to these real serious problems that we need to yeah, face. Yeah, and, and get everybody frustrated in the environmental sector because it, what it sounds like is I don't care what the issues are. I don't care what the, you yeah, know, the, the controversy look, is. I want, it, I want it approved right yeah, now. We've talked about this. Look, we have clean air. I mean, you, people may disagree with this, but the data is strong. We have very clean air in the United States. Now. I mean, places that were terrible, Pittsburgh, uh, Los Angeles, New York, the air there is so much better than it was 30 years ago. And, you know, whether you like it or not, that was a regulatory program. It probably could have been done more efficiently. It could have probably done at lower cost, but we got there. We got to a much yeah, cleaner. Yeah. And you know, you see many uh, immigrants from China desperate to come here because they just, you know, the environment just is so for much the air, better. Yeah. yeah, just for the yeah, air. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And but I got to add though yeah. that uh, you know, where a couple of years ago in Beijing mm -hmm. you had to wear a, a mask. You uh, still have to wear a mask. <laughs> okay. <laughs> It hasn't gotten a lot better. So how, how, you know, do we want to achieve energy dominance? So, yeah, is there, so a, is there should, a benefit in so that? So I think, I think the way to kind of crosswalk that rather aggressive term into something useful is we want to be able to export and expand the development of our natural resources that make sense to export within the realm, and export and develop within the realm of common sense environmental rules. And I think there was a lot of mis, let's say, misallocation of resources even among the environmentalists. You know, they fought very hard for the Keystone Pipeline. They fought very hard against the Dakota Access Pipeline. These major infrastructure projects were, which were part of this North American Petroleum Renaissance. And at the margin, I would have said, look, I, I think you're fighting the wrong issue. Right? You should be, we should be working on research and development and transitioning into the future in a more regular wa way, not in these huge battles over things which have high economic value and were worth a lot to not just the capitalists, but the workers on the field. Mm -hmm. Well, but when you say dominance, uh, I mean, my sense of it, if that, if that is this administration's term, do dominance, uh, they're not including uh, renewables, because I don't think they like renewables too much. Where, where does renewables fit in dominance? So I think, yeah, so may, the renewables are in many ways, and we've talked about this, the renewables are largely important in the utility sector. The utility, utility sector today is still dominated, dominated by regulatory programs and authorities from local public utility commissions, right? Yeah. So the president could hate renewables, but that has nothing to do with what Hawaii decides to do. The federal agencies have no kind of reach here unless it's in the subsidies, which are legislatively formed and approved and are slowly going to fade out over the next five or six Sounds years. like it, yeah. 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 But presumably, these renewables now have had a pretty good head start. And in many cases, they're quite cost effective. So if we have renewables, I mean, we, you and I have spoken about yeah. this many times, is it ultimately an economic question? 
Uh, because right, right, right now, I, I mean, tell me if you disagree, renewables are more expensive than uh, alternative fuels. So yeah, so people say they're not, but they are more expensive than a lot of conventional fuels. Yeah. Everything's more than expensive than coal, but not every. But you, you're not going to build a new coal-fired power plant in the U.S. Right, not, you know, I don't care what President Trump says. There'll be pushback all across the. The board Public Utility that. Commission's not going to do it. It's too risky for yeah, them. It's yeah. not about whether they like coal or not. They're just not going to take on that risk. Yeah, yeah. So uh, where where do renewables fit in energy dominance? I mean, do you see? I mean, I I, I can't imagine his his vision for this is really excludes renewables, but. Uh, if we look at it in terms of a, you know, a better, better definition of dominance, uh, do you see that, uh, say, in 5, 10, 15, 20 years, we will have national, we have the possibility of national dominance, including renewables, with a substantial percentage of renewables? So the installed capacity of renewables is going to continue to grow. The, whether we dispatch that renewable power is going to depend on a lot of factors having to do with building out the grid, putting more resiliency into the grid. And uh, if you look at the big models and the official government models, in 20 years, I still think you're not going to see more than 20%, 25% dispatchable power on renewables. And that's because? That's because even if you go with an aggressive program like a carbon tax or an aggressive program to cut back uh, e emissions of CO2, in the utility sector. The most efficient strategy is energy efficiency. If you look at the big models run by Ex ExxonMobil and the, and the government and everyone else, and you go out to 2040, you still end up with, you know, the share of coal declines a bit, the share of, of uh, you know, liquid petroleum use sort of stays where it is, gas grows, and all the cats and dogs of renewables are below 20%. Mm -hmm. The big 90% of the shift in the emissions, the reduction, is efficiency. Yeah, oh, and uh, you know, that's understand. We have a lot of efficiency effort here at Hawaii. Yeah, yeah. So, I mean, I was just wondering, to, you know, we don't have a minute left, but uh, just, just wondering, um, uh, he, has, he has made those pipelines happen. I mean, I think that's really... Yeah, he, he, he is, he, he's... He's done what the executive branch can do to make right. them happen. Right. It's really, in this case, it was all done. It was, so it was easy for him right. to stop intervening. You could argue that what the President Obama was doing was he was still intervening right. after the deal right. was done. Right. So, and he, so he made them both happen. He and made he, them and both that happen. very hard, but he, yeah, did, yeah, do yeah, that. he and did that. So now we have the pipelines. I just wonder, in this energy dominance analysis, uh, if there's anything else, and you know, I'm just clearly, I, I don't agree. A lot of people in Hawaii don't agree right, with sure. anything he does. But uh, <laughs> if he wants to achieve this dominance in his definition, what else can he do? He's not going to be able to control the PUCs in the various states. Um, what is what, so what in, can in he a, do? So in a traditional Republican administration, what he can do is say, okay, we should fight this out in the marketplace. We should kind of intervene a bit, at least in the research and development place, and we should intervene also to protect uh, health and safety. And, but I'm going to take out all the kind of silly regulatory programs that are preventing good projects from going forward. That would be, and then he would say, I'm for all of the above. <laughs> now everyone says they're for all of the above. Sure. Well, that's a silly statement <laughs> because you should... All of the above, that's like going to the buffet, you know? That's not really, <laughs> you should be for all of the above, that makes sense. Yeah. Lots of things above don't make sense. Policy choices, yeah. yeah. Right. <laughs> well, wh what about uh, renewables? I mean, uh, he doesn't particularly like renewables. What can he do to stop the march of renewables? I don't think renewables? he can do a lot. That's basically set by the Congress. It's already set. I don't think Secretary Perry is going to go on a tirade against renewables. You may see some of the massive amount of money that's going into climate research cut back. You're going to see that. Mm -hmm. I'm not sure all that research was useful anyway, but, uh, and research will continue anyway. Yes. And climate will continue anyway. So one last question on this, on yeah. this very point about energy dominance. It, it seems to include exports, seems to include export Exports of energy. is a big theme of that. Big theme, and, and uh, so from a policy point of view, I mean, ex forget about ec economics, national mm -hmm. economics, and. Uh, you know, uh, interested parties, mm -hmm. if you will, who would make money by export. 
Uh, is export in the interest of the United States? Absolutely. I think uh, as a kind of beacon of stability and uh, democracy and uh, the security of the United States, that having the U.S. as a major supplier to allies and friends around the world of not just uh, natural gas, we're now exporting over a million barrels a day of crude oil uh, to uh, Asian markets. Which we could stop exporting if we wanted. We could wanted. stop. We had to change the law to permit it. If it got to be strategical. Right. Uh, again, the other thing, and you mentioned this before we started the show, and is that export has a diplomatic implication. Exactly. A global diplomacy is involved in export. Yeah. Can you talk about that? Yes. If you look at uh, President Trump's visit to Poland recently, uh, before he arrived there, the Poles announced that they were buying LNG from the United States. Which is something, because they normally buy Gazprom, so yeah, it's different. They wanted to show that there was an alternative to Gazprom. They wanted to show that uh, the U.S. could be, and the U.S. wanted to show we could be relied upon to provide this gas. And so it was a symbolically, if not a substantively a big deal. It's a very important symbolic And issue. it really is. And within Europe now, there's a lot of attempts to install more LNG receiving facilities to find more ways to use U.S. gas. To avoid dependence as a on counterweight, Gazprom. just as a counterweight. Yeah. yeah, great. You know, I'm so glad you're here, Lou. I'm, I'm so glad I get to, you know, we get to spend social time together yeah. and everything on this trip for sure. Absolutely. Thank you so much for coming down, and thank you for all the shows we've done over the past what couple of it was years. My pleasure. It's lovely to have you here. <laughs> Thanks, Jay. Thank you, Lou. Aloha. <laughs>